Thanks for tuning in to Ag PhD. I'm Brian Hefty. And I'm Darren Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. One of the things we're going to talk about is plant growth hormones and plant growth regulators. One in particular, gibberellic acid, has shown some response on our farm over a number of years now. We're going to talk about what to expect from gibberellic acid and a product like Rise Up Smart Grass. We're also going to cover soybean nodulation. What's it going to take to get more nodules on your soybeans and, in effect, more nitrogen into your plant? We'll talk about that today. Well, more nitrogen into our crop is normally a good thing. If we can keep our weed of the week out of the picture, well, that leaves more of all the plant food for our crop. We'll show you how to stop our weed of the week, but first, here's our Farm Basics. Farm Basics is brought to you by the Liberty Link Trait and Liberty Herbicide from Bayer. The most reliable weed management solution, Liberty Link and Liberty Herbicide are the link to efficient row crop production and sustainable weed management. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk about what is an economic threshold for insects, and you know what? Why do farmers even have to spray insecticide? All right, let's first talk about this term, economic threshold. When farmers see bugs out in the field, they're often thinking, well, how many bugs is my threshold where a spray application would be justified? Well, the economic threshold really determines it by dollars and cents. So if there are bugs out in your field causing $10 worth of damage and it costs $5 to spray, clearly we've reached an economic threshold. If we've got $5 or more damage going on in the field, well then it's worth spraying. Now for farmers, most of the time they look at a two to one return on investment. So if it's going to cost them $5, they wanna see a potential gain or yield protection of at least double what they're spending. One of the things that's really changed is there was a lot of university research out 20, 30, 40 years ago saying what the economic thresholds are. Well, since then, crop prices have gone way up and some of the input costs, like the insecticide costs, have gone way down. In the meantime, as well, we've had yields go much higher. So let's say that you're going to lose 5% of yield. Well, it makes a lot of difference if we're talking 5% of 100 bushel corn or 5% of 250 bushel corn. So what I'm getting at here is, yes, there are some old established economic thresholds out there. I'm just saying in a lot of cases, those don't work anymore. You can still use the formulas, but you just have to plug in today's numbers. The other thing that farmers will look at is some bugs can be a vector for disease, meaning they're carrying disease with them. And many times those diseases are not something that farmers want to see out in the field, like bean pod model virus, for example, or barley yellow dwarf. Well, we don't want any of that in our field. So if you see insects that potentially are carrying disease, many times that throws this economic threshold right out of consideration entirely because the farmer says, man, I can't have any of those bugs in my field or now this disease is gonna run rampant through my field. So you can see where we're going here. If it's an insect that just feeds on some leaves and if that insect is gone, well, there's no more damage versus an insect that could carry a disease that could impact the crop the rest of the season. Well, there are some differences there in terms of deciding if a farmer should treat or not. The other thing farmers have to consider is how many insects are out there at or near economic thresholds. For example, let's say that you had grasshoppers, bean leaf beetles, and soybean aphids all at just under economic threshold individually. Well, if you add the three up, now in effect, you could justify treatment. So those are the types of things farmers are looking at. And believe me, as a farmer, I can just tell you, I don't wanna spend any more money than necessary to raise a great crop. I would love to have where my crop is fantastic and I spent no money. That's the ideal scenario. But unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way. The good news here is with a lot of these insecticides, they're much safer than the old things. The most common insecticide we spray on our farm is a pyrethroid. That was developed from the chrysanthemum flower that is relatively safe to humans and animals and everything. Now, I'm not saying not use personal protective equipment, not be safe around it, that type of thing, but I am saying it's much safer than a lot of the insecticides we used to deal with years ago. Farmers have lots of tough decisions when it comes to insect control and also control of our Weed of the Week. Can you identify this week's weed? Leading the charge in strip tillage for more than a decade, the Soil Warrior brings the future to your farm today. Unlock your nutrient investment with QuickRoots technology. 
It contains two powerful microbes that can help free nutrients bound in your soil, which can improve access to key nutrients for healthy crops, N, P, and K. Applying QuickRoots technology to seed can lead to improved root and shoot growth, increased yield potential, and maximized nutrient investment. See how you can make your fertilizer dollar go further at MonsantoBioAg.com slash QuickRoots. This agro liquid line is something special. A lot of really impressive playmakers. Take a look at Sure K. This guy is an enigma. But wrap your head around the exceptionally high plant response when compared to conventional potassium sources, the research proven plant availability, plus flexible application options and mixing capabilities. Really stellar performance stats. Sure K is a true standout, and that's a winning goal on any field. Tired of that old warped poly boom ruining your spray applications? Express Boom from Hypro is a fully assembled stainless steel boom that ensures an even application of chemicals every time. Don't wait another season. Upgrade today. Hypro, helping you spray better. I know a lot of people that have them and I don't know anybody that doesn't like their Morton building. The crew was really in my book top notch. The quality of this building is second to none, and they make sure before you walk away that you're happy. This is my dream barn. I think it ended up looking even better than I thought it would. People love it. When they get in here, they're just in awe. Morton Buildings, for work, for life, for generations. Smart farming is playing hockey with my son. Sweetie, I'm excited to go. Yeah. <laughs> Smart farming is going on more family vacations. Smart farming is getting some much needed rest. Smart farming is spending more time doing what you love. Make it happen with Farm Command. What if you could influence plant growth early in the season? Could that lead to an impact all year long? Well, of course it can. We're going to talk about one of those things, gibberellic acid, that could influence early season growth in certain crops. Gibberellic acid is something that naturally occurs in plants. So that's great news because it extends the stem. In other words, stem elongation, that's heavily dependent on what are the gibberellic acid levels in the plant. Well, the bad news is when your plant is really cold, when the soil is cold, the air temperature is cold, there isn't a lot of gibberellic acid getting produced. So let's say you have a pasture, or maybe it's silage corn, and you want more tonnage. More tonnage means more food for the livestock, which means more profit for you. So what can you do to get the gibberellic acid levels higher in the plant? The best thing to do is just flat out put more gibberellic acid on the plant when the temperatures are cold. What we find is if you're able to treat that plant when it's roughly 50 to 65 degrees approximately, so I'm talking basically early in the spring or late in the fall if it's pasture grass for example, then you absolutely can increase stem elongation. You will increase tonnage. Well, there are a lot of gibberellic acid products out there on the market, and they're at various concentrations. So to say, oh, you use this much of a rate, it's kind of hard to do. Uh, one of the more concentrated ones that we've found is a product that we've used for a number of years. It's called Rise Up Smart Grass. So Rise Up Smart Grass is from Valent, and we have used this at really pretty low levels, and we've seen good gains. So this is the reason why we're talking about this today. I also wanted to talk to you about it today because, hey, it is early in the spring. We're about at the time of year when you should be spraying this, but if you get too late, you don't want to use it. We found that it doesn't really seem to pay very well, at least for us at this point, when we're spraying when the weather's warm. Again, the reason why is because as the weather warms up, the plant is naturally producing lots of gibberellic acid. So again, you want to spray this relatively early in the spring or again late in the fall when temperatures do cool down. We don't see it making a big difference in terms of the nutritional value of the, the forage that you're feeding. We don't see that, oh wow, it's going to have lots more protein or it's going to have lots more micronutrients in it or something like that. Yeah, but that. Darren, the grass can look a little more yellow and maybe even the corn a little more yellow after you spray it. 
Well, sure, whenever you've got rapid growth, and we see that during the growing season, just watch your cornfield. When we have some times during the season where the corn looks a little more pale and other times where it looks a little darker. Yeah, when it's growing that quickly, especially early in the season when it's tough pulling nutrients out, it's probably going to look a little bit more pale for a little bit of time. But you think about it, you've got the same amount of nutrients in there just spread out a little bit more. Well, the, the thing that I wanted to get to, though, is maybe you need a few more nutrients. If you're going to have a bunch more tonnage, maybe you need a little bit more in terms of nutrient early in the season. That's something you can at least think about. The other thing that I want you to consider here is, well, it does affect tonnage. It does not seem to affect overall grain yield on average, at least what we've found so far. Now, it's not to say some studies haven't shown grain yield increase, but where we see this really fit is for people who are after tonnage. So if you want more grass production, if you want more corn silage, that seems to be, to us at least, where this fits best. Well, gibberellic acid is just one of the many different plant growth regulators or plant growth hormones that are out there on the market today. But it's one that we've used for a number of years and we've seen some good gains, especially early in the season and later on into the fall. One other thing that's always paid for us is keeping our weed of the week out of our fields. We'll show you how to stop this weed coming up later in the show. There are 6,272,640 square inches in an acre. We count it. Why? Because we designed the Tiger Mate 255 field cultivator and 2000 series early riser planter to maximize every single one. So when you create the most level seed bed in the industry and target a nickel size area to plant a seed and never miss, you'll know in high efficiency farming, there's one name to count on, Case IH. Rethink productivity. Learn more at caseih.com slash every inch. The buzz on this line is probably the best in 10 years, both in soil and in the plant. Joe, you've been doing this for a while. What's your take? Well, Don, you take a player like high energy in, three forms of nitrogen, plus sulfur and iron with slow release technology, he's making plays all season long. Oh, look at his numbers. He's getting it done. But don't forget about in response. This guy's designed for a quick release nitrogen. It's looking like another championship season for Agro Liquid. In life, when you put the max in, you get the max out. It's no different for your corn, which is why 40 years of effort have gone into proving that Instinct and Enserve nitrogen stabilizers do more than just stabilize nitrogen, they maximize nitrogen. So your corn gives you the max in return. Introducing the SoilMax ZD48, the newest addition to the SoilMax Gold Digger lineup. The first plow designed for smaller class tractors, the ZD48 has been tested on tractors weighing between 10,000 and 16,000 pounds with excellent results. Designed for row crop farms, vineyards, irrigation, and specialty crop farms. The SoilMax ZD48 will install tile up to 48 inches deep as well as install 3 or 4 inch tile. The ZD48 truly opens up the world of tile installation to more farms than ever before. Smart farming is playing hockey with my son. Alright, sweetie, are you excited to go? Yeah. <laughs> Smart farming is going on more family vacations. Smart farming is getting some much needed rest. Smart farming is spending more time doing what you love. Make it happen with Farm Command. One of the most important nutrients, even for a soybean crop, is nitrogen, but you may not have to fertilize at all with nitrogen. The plant can naturally get it through the process of soybean nodulation, but how can you get more nodulation and in effect get more nitrogen into the plant? That's what we want to talk about today. Soybeans are a legume crop, and let's face it, Brian, they're taken for granted. It's, oh, I don't yep. have to put any nitrogen out there. I've got nodules that are going to take care of that, but you know, that may be true when you have 20 bushel beans, but when you're going for 100, there's no way they're going to produce enough nitrogen for a hundred bushels of soybeans so we have to help that plant out. The cheapest way to get the nitrogen into the crop and one of the most effective ways is to improve nodulation in the soybeans. Well one way that you can get more nodulation is by adding more bacteria to the soil through the process of inoculation. All soybean inoculant is, is live bacteria, it's live rhizobia bacteria, and in many cases, it's certain strains of bacteria that are very efficient at producing nitrogen, or in effect, pulling nitrogen out of the air and converting it into a form that the plant can use 
So we really encourage you in all cases, and I don't care even if you're raising continuous soybeans, inoculate your soybeans. Well, there's two things here that I see that could go wrong, and there's lots of things that could go wrong, but let's just say you did everything right, handling inoculant and getting it applied. Once it gets into your soil, if you've got a wacky soil pH, you're not gonna have very good survival of those bacteria. So that could be a big problem for you and lead to poor nodulation. The other thing is if you have a heavy amount of nitrate left over from the season before. Now we saw that on some farms in 2017 where guys had a lot of mineralization out in the field and not tremendous yields. Well, they had all kinds of nitrate left. Well, if there's plenty of free nitrate in the soil, how much work does the soybean plant have to do to provide food for bacteria when it can just have that nitrate for free? Well, it's not gonna do it. It's just gonna take the free nitrate. So there's always this talk about, hey, if you apply a bunch of N, you're gonna hurt your nodulation. I, I would say it might delay the nodulation. It's not gonna completely eliminate it, but it certainly will delay it for some time. All right, so I'm glad Darren brought that up because that's where I'm gonna to disagree to a point. What we find is if you're putting 50 pounds, 100 pounds of nitrogen on there, that's no big deal. Don't forget that if you're trying to raise 60, 70, 80 bushel beans, you're gonna need three, 400 pounds of nitrogen. Is 50 or 100 any big deal? No way. You're still gonna have great nodulation, most likely if you've done everything else right. So don't even worry about that so much. What we do wanna get concerned about, again, is coming back to this process of how do we get the best nodulation? Now, Darren touched on the soil pH, but let's talk about the specific pH that we want. We'd really like to see that pH in the 6.3 to 6.8 range. That's where we find the best overall nodulation. It's basically the environment that the bacteria love the most. The other thing is the bacteria need to have oxygen they need oxygen to survive and if we've got soil compaction or if we've got very poorly drained soils what we find is those bacteria will die and you won't get them back later in the season they're just gone and it's not just short term do we have enough oxygen it's year round so in other words if you say well during the crop season i was fine yeah my water table came up over the winter time uh, no big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal because the bacteria still need to survive over the winter time. If you have a high water table, now a lot of those bacteria are dead and you're not going to have great nodulation going into the next year. The other thing is the nutrient balance in your soil. You've got to have a good balance of nutrients out there of everything, but then there are some specific ones that play into nodulation. One of them that doesn't get talked about enough is molybdenum. And it's funny, we did some tests on our farm just to see what's our molybdenum level because on normal soil tests, well, it doesn't even have molybdenum on there. They don't even check for it. You have to spend really quite a bit more money to get a specific molybdenum test from most labs. Well, when we tested for molybdenum, we had some fields where it was non-detectable. Well, if we're non-detectable, and this is an important nutrient for nodulation, I think this is one that we need to get more of out in our field, and you may as well. I would start by measuring in your fields just to see where your levels are, and then going from there, because there's a lot of different ways to get molybdenum out in your fields. Well, in addition to maybe pulling a few soil tests for molybdenum, really look at plant tissue analysis. You can test the soybean as you go through the season and see if there is some molybdenum getting into that plant. All right, Darren mentioned this nutrient balance and stuff in the soil. Here's a lot of what it really amounts to. Okay, you gotta think about why are these bacteria colonizing on the root and why are they bringing nitrogen into the plant? Well, the reason why is because the plant is providing sugar for the, the bacteria. It's providing food for the bacteria. So just think about it logically. If I have a super healthy soybean plant, is it probably able to produce more sugar? You bet it is. So you really wanna look at your N, P, and K. You wanna look at your secondary nutrients. You wanna look at your micronutrients. Again, you gotta take care of your drainage and your pH. Do all those things right. Control the weeds, the insects, diseases, everything. And you will find you're going to have better nodulation simply because your plant fed more bacteria. One other topic that we hear from time to time when we think about nodulation is Roundup. And oh boy, everybody wants to blame everything on Roundup. But it is a fact that in a plant, when you spray Roundup on a Roundup ready plant, it compartmentalizes that Roundup. It doesn't metabolize it. It just pushes it down into the root system to kind of get it out of the way so the plant can keep growing. Well, what's down in the root system? nodules. They're actually inside the root, right? So when you've got nodules down there and you're shoving Roundup down by those nodules, there's a lot of speculation that, well, the bacteria don't like it and they leave, or maybe it's toxic to the bacteria and they die. Uh, I don't know what the real story is. Brian, what's your feeling on this? Well, all I know is I'm not that worried about it. 
we've never found anything on any wide scale that using Roundup, Roundup beans, anything like that, have fewer nodules, lower yield, those types of things. So could there be something there? Yes, it's possible. Could it be that, well, maybe if I delayed my Roundup, I might have 0.1 bushels more? It's possible. Well, that's been the I just don't think it's any real big deal. That's been the observation is delaying the Roundup application, just let the plant build up more nodules and it was more able to tolerate that. I, I don't know, like you say, I don't know if it's a huge deal or not. I think these other factors are way more important. Totally agree, totally agree. And we've got control of all of them. So when you're thinking about nodulation in your field, it is so critically important in a legume crop like soybeans. We talked about a number of factors today to make sure that you have good nodulation so you produce plenty of nitrogen so you can achieve high yields. Well, if you're shooting for high yields, you need to have great weed control too. We'll show you how to stop our Weed of the Week coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Dow AgroSciences. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift. And near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? Weed of the Week is giant ragweed. I'm not sure what we were feeding our hogs when we were kids, but right off the edge of the pen, we had some giant ragweed. And I remember yeah. it was kind of along a building, and I bet they got 10 feet tall that year. And, and I didn't know what that weed was because we'd never seen it out walking our bean I fields. love how Darren mentions that year. It was like every year, Darren. I well, have no idea why Dad didn't have us controlling no, that no, weed when no. we had what to I'm, with every single weed out What I'm the saying field. is I had to ask Dad, well, <laughs> what is this weed? Because I don't see it out in the field. And he said, well, this is giant ragweed, and this is why I have to use pre-emerge herbicides or you'd be seeing it like crazy all over our fields. Well, yeah, but when you talk about pre-emerge herbicides, back then we didn't have the best pre-emerge herbicides, but what it took is the same thing it takes today, a combination of pre-emerge herbicides in a lot of cases. So if I think about soybeans, for example, I really like the three pre program. Yup, the yellows aren't the best, but Metribuzin's pretty decent, and then throw in a PPO like Valor or Authority. There's a bunch of different formulations of Authority, so it's Authority premixed with something else. One of the common ones that we hear about with giant ragweed control is using first rate. And guys say, well, I wanna use authority first, so I get that first rate out there, which also has impact on the giant ragweed. I agree with you. The problem is once you use it pre, now you can't use it again post Well, safely. you shouldn't use it post. There are some people out there saying, oh yeah, no problem, you can use it pre and post. Well, you can if you want to grow soybeans again the next year, but if you want to rotate to corn, don't even think about it. All right, let's talk about the other post-emerge options. I really like Liberty. I also like Extend in Roundup Ready to Extend. Soybeans both work very good on giant ragweed. Turning to corn, what I'd suggest is use Verdict Down. That seems to work pretty well. Yes, you can use Sure Start and Triple Flex. They'll have a little suppression, no big deal. But the big thing is post-emerge, you've got the best product there is, Status. You can throw some atrazine in with it. You can also use an HPPD with Status. Now you've really bumped up the control. In wheat, we don't normally face giant ragweed problems, but we can start with Sharpen Down and come over the top with a high rate of Husky. Well, that's it for our Weed of the Week, Giant Ragweed. Stay tuned, Iron Talk is coming up next. In life, when you put the max in, you get the max out. It's no different for your corn, which is why 40 years of effort have gone into proving that Instinct and Anserve nitrogen stabilizers do more than just stabilize nitrogen, they maximize nitrogen. So your corn gives you the max in return. Let's face it, Joe. Some of these guys aren't easy to play. Biologicals are expensive. Humates and plant growth regulators are messy. Yeah, but AgroLiquid has four new players that have really eliminated those problems. The Primer Go line has helped their team realize the benefits. Wait, 
So season-long nutrition and optimized yields while creating a biologically active soil? That's right. Primary Oil Line is a fantastic addition to AgroLiquid Stellar Team. I know a lot of people that have them and I don't know anybody that doesn't like their Morton building. The crew was really in my book top notch. The quality of this building is second to none and they make sure before you walk away that you're happy. This is my dream barn. I think it ended up looking even better than I thought it would. People love it. When they get in here, they're just in awe. Morton Buildings, for work, for life, for generations. Are you looking for an easy way to apply dry powdered products to your stored grain? Do you want to use the applicator recommended by industry leaders for products like Diacon D and other dry powder products? Changing Time CT applicators successfully apply a diversity of products quickly, easily, and accurately. The innovative CT applicators are designed to give you the most accurate application of products such as talc, inoculants, fertilizers, and other dry products. For commercial use or on the farm, you need the applicator industry leaders are using. CT applicators for the changing times. Unlock the nutrients in your soil with Tag Team LCOXC Liquid Soybean, a triple action biological product that helps improve nutrient access. Together with the LCO molecule, a rhizobia delivers nitrogen fixing benefits, while an additional microbe makes phosphate in the soil more available. Three powerful technologies in one extra concentrated formulation. See how it can help your yield potential at MonsantoBioAg.com unlock. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. There are 6,272,640 square inches in an acre. We counted. Why? Because we designed the TigerMate 255 field cultivator and 2000 series early riser planter to maximize every single one. So when you create the most level seed bed in the industry and target a nickel size area to plant a seed and never miss, you'll know in high efficiency farming, there's one name to count on. Case IH. Rethink productivity. Learn more at caseih.com slash every inch. There's so much work to do in the spring that finding a way to do two things at once can really save some time. If mixing herbicides with fertilizer is one of those two jobs at once on your farm, I'll share some tips to help it go smoothly in today's Iron Talk. Full disclosure here, we mix liquid fertilizer with pre-plant herbicides every year on our farm on thousands of acres. And yes, we've had trouble a couple of times in the past. However, we mix the two with full confidence today based on what we've learned, which is why I'm excited to share with you today these five steps to successfully mix herbicides and fertilizers. First, jar test. Do your exact mixture in advance in a small, clear jar. This can help you avoid a large-scale mess in your sprayer. Also, if you really want to play it safe, jar test with each batch of fertilizer you get, as there may be some variants batch to batch throughout the season. Second, herbicides may not mix well with straight fertilizer. It's best to mix some water into the solution first, or to dilute the herbicide with water before putting it in the tank. This gives the herbicide something to bind to, as fertilizer isn't always the best host. Third, warmer temperatures help nearly everything work better. So keep the fertilizer and herbicide in warm storage, if at all possible. Fourth, agitation throughout the whole process can help keep things in suspension. And fifth, don't let spray tanks with blended products sit. Mix up only what you can spray right away. You can save some time and get two things done at once on the farm. Most pre-plant herbicides can be mixed with fertilizers. Just follow our five steps to avoid problems on your farm. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. Closed captioning for Ag PhD is sponsored by Norwood Sales. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt in a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. That's all the time we have for today's show, but before we go, we want to invite you to tune in to the Ag PhD Radio Show. You'll find us each weekday on Sirius XM Channel 147 at 2 p.m. Central. And don't miss us next week on the Ag PhD TV Show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. 
Planting a crop not intended for harvest is becoming a regular thing. It's called a cover crop. The use of cover crops is on the rise due to the many benefits they provide the soil, including reducing erosion, improving nutrient availability, and breaking up soil compaction. To learn about cover crops and more, visit rnmf.org.